Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your host is Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor and founder of the Chalcedon Teacher Training Institute. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Out of the Question podcast. I think most people consider that the pagan practice of human sacrifice is a thing of the past. Depictions of cultures where people were sacrificed alive have been the subject of films and documentaries. However, I believe most would say that this doesn't happen anymore. But sad to say, it does. The organ transplant industry began in the 1960s, and as a result, many consider it a noble and considerate thing to register themselves as organ donors after their death. A year ago, in episode 210, I interviewed Dr. Heidi Klessig with a podcast entitled, How Should Christians View Organ Transplants? In it, she explained that there are certain kinds of organ donations where a living person can donate part of a liver, a kidney, blood, or bone marrow to another who has need, and the donor remains alive. These procedures are not without the possibility of complications, but in the end, both parties are living. However, organs, such as a lung or a heart, must come from someone who is still alive, although after the procedure, they no longer are. So how does this happen? Well, Dr. Klesig is back with us today to discuss this very important thing based on her new book, The Brain Death Fallacy. Thanks for agreeing to come on the podcast again, Heidi. Oh, thanks so much, Andrea. It's a pleasure. All right. The expression brain dead is an accepted one today, somewhat in jest. A person might say, boy, I'm not thinking straight today. I am so brain dead. However, as a medical diagnosis, it is much more significant and less funny. Would you please share with my listeners the reality behind brain death and why it is a fallacy? Oh, sure. I'd like to do that. So I think One of the most helpful cases to understand this is something that's happened within recent memory, and that is the tragic death of actress Anne Hesch. Uh, Your listeners might recall that uh, Anne Hesch was in a car accident uh, August 5th of 2022, and and at first she was uh, communicating with providers at the scene. But by August 11th, uh, her spokesperson said she was not expected to survive, and indeed her doctors declared her to be brain dead later that evening. Now, because Anne Hesch was a registered organ donor, uh, her doctors kept her on life support after she was declared dead until her organs could be harvested on August 14th. Uh, interestingly, the Los Angeles Times with the morning paper the day after her brain death determination, declared her dead on August 12th in their obituary column. But the New York Times and Washington Post held their obituaries until her actual death by organ harvesting on August 14th. And when asked about this, the Washington Post obituaries editor, Adam Bernstein, said, it's black and white. There's no gray area here. If you're on life support, you're still alive. Other publications can make their own judgment about when they're comfortable publishing, but I'm comfortable when someone is actually dead, right? So it brings up the question, when is someone actually dead? And in biological terms, if you think back to your high school biology, death is the loss of the integrative functioning of the organism as a whole. I mean, if you think about it, A six-year-old child knows the difference between a live squirrel in the backyard and one dead on the road, right? The uh, the live squirrel, the live cat, dog, the live person has all of their functions intricately integrated. Your heart is beating, your lungs are breathing, your body is circulating, you're moving about, your, your body is characterized by processes of growth and life. But when death occurs, a line is crossed, and those processes change to processes of decay, putrefaction, coldness, stillness. And most faith traditions define death as being equivalent with biologically 
being dead. Now, I mean, traditionally, we believe the departure of our God-given spirit is what causes the loss of bodily integration. You know, when Abraham breathes his last and gives up the ghost, all his systems shut down. So the, we, of course, don't have a, a soulometer or a spiritometer. We can't see the spirit departing. So we are dependent on looking at the loss of those biological functions to determine when dead ha- death has occurred. Uh, and doctors are pretty good at this in general, but not perfect. Uh, there's an interesting case I like to describe um, of a 91-year-old lady, Janina Kolkowitz. She was declared dead in 2014, according to the usual, can't hear a pulse, uh, can't listen to lungs. She seems to be cold and dead, but she had a spontaneous return of her circulation and woke up in the morgue feeling chilly and asking for tea and pancakes. <laughs> so, you know, her doctor was a bit embarrassed. I mean, the thing about declaring death is there's also an observation period that needs to be given. There has to be a passage of time to be sure that the person is certainly biologically dead. And our traditional practices surrounding death have always include, you know, time for a, a visitation, a wake, uh, a, a, you know, a vigil. People have always understood we need to sit and, and, be with this person to be sure that death has occurred. Uh, interestingly, okay, so I'm going to stop you for a second yeah, there because there's ahead. some points there that I think are important. So for thousands of years, I mean thousands of years, people knew what dead was, okay? You just gave an example, and there are others where everybody thought someone was dead and then the person spoke or moved or something like that. So... Why did it change in the 1960s? Why did suddenly we need to have a new definition of death as opposed to what had been a longstanding accepted definition? Well, uh, in the 1960s, uh, there were a couple new technologies starting out, actually in the 1950s. And there were intensive care units now, which had not been in existence previously. And there were ventilators, which was another new development. And these th- types of technologies were keeping people alive who previously would have very quickly passed away. And this led to concerns that, you know, goodness, you know, we don't yet have treatment for these people's conditions. This is totally new. Uh, are these people just going to be stacking up in our hospitals? Uh, and are we never going to be able to treat their problems? And so there was sort of a utilitarian concern that, gosh, you know, we just can't have people on ventilators stacking up in the hospitals. What are we going to do with them all? Thankfully, you know, medical science did progress and new treatments were engineered. And many of the people who were thought to be completely terminal now are very successfully and easily treated. The second thing besides the new technology, however, that drove a new definition of death was the idea of organ transplants. And in uh, December of 1967, uh, Dr. Christian Bernard performed the first heart transplant, uh, which took place in South Africa. And in America, a few days later, a, a baby's heart was transplanted into another baby, though these two first transplants, neither one of them was particularly successful. The, the person in South Africa lived a matter of weeks and the baby lived a matter of hours. It made physicians start to think, you know, we need, we need to cover our backsides because the conditions surrounding these transplants were both morally and legally questionable as to were the doctors coming in and stopping hearts that were beating to be removed into other people. And this, in fact, did occur with the first successful heart transplant in January of 1968, also performed by Dr. Christian Bernard. A black man named Clive Hope suffered a brain bleed while picnicking with his family on New Year's Day of 1968 and was taken to the hospital. His attending physician, Dr. Hoffenberg, was approached that same day by the transplant team who wanted him to declare Haupt with his beating heart dead so that his heart could be transplanted into someone else. 
you know, initially, Dr. Hoffenberg was very uncomfortable at the idea of declaring a man who was breathing, albeit with a ventilator, and whose heart was still beating. How can you declare this man dead? Uh, reportedly, one of the transplant surgeons said, you know, God, Bill, what sort of heart are you going to give us? Meaning that if doctors waited for Mr. Clive Haupt's heart to stop beating, it would very rapidly begin to decompose and be unsuitable for transplant. Many people who say, hey, if I'm dead, people can have my organs. They don't understand that per the definition that has lasted for thousands of years, only in one sense, if you use an altered definition of life and death, are they actually dead when they're going to give their heart or their lungs? Absolutely right. And this is one of my biggest concerns with the transplant process is that people are not being given properly informed consent about what does it mean to become an organ donor. They're not being told that if you're an organ donor, your heart will be beating, you will be warm, you will be perhaps in a coma that doctors believe is irreversible, but In point of fact, people have woken up after being declared brain dead. You will have wound healing. Women have delivered children when brain dead. These people are not biologically dead. And that deception is something that really bothers me about this process. So you give an example in your book about a young girl. I think she was in Oakland, California, who was classified as brain dead. But her parents objected to the cessation of treatment and they went through a nightmare, but they succeeded in getting her transported to New Jersey, which was the only state in the union that wouldn't force people to go along with this. And then years after the diagnosis of being dead, she actually started her menstrual cycle. And as you say in the book, corpses don't menstruate, do they? That's correct. You're, you're referring to a, a, a little girl named Jahai McMath. She was 13 years old when she uh, was undergoing a tonsillectomy and a, a re- reconstruction of her palate for sleep apnea when she had uncontrolled bleeding and went into cardiac arrest. And doctors very quickly went on to try to push the idea of brain death on her family, whereas her family was saying, no, we want everything done for our little girl. But unfortunately, because of the pushing of the hospital uh, doctors and the brain death standards and law in California, she was diagnosed as being brain dead according to the 2010 American Academy of Neurology Standards. She was given three neurologic exams by neurologists. She had four electroencephalograms or EEGs that showed flatline. She had a brain blood flow scan that showed no intracranial blood flow. She had three apnea tests where she was removed from the ventilator and observed for breathing and did not breathe on her own. So California declared her dead and actually issued a death certificate for her. Uh, If you saw that death certificate, you might be surprised at the cause of her death. The cause of death was listed as pending investigation. Uh, That's because her parents disputed that she was dead. This was their little girl. She was warm. She was moving occasionally. They did not believe, being Christians, that her spirit had left her body. And so they were able to find help. And and Jahai McMath was transported, as you mentioned, to New Jersey, which is the only state in the Union with a religious exemption to a diagnosis of brain death. So if you do not believe on a religious basis that brain death is death, Uh, In the state of New Jersey, you must be declared dead only according to the traditional heart and lung criteria. And as you mentioned, after she moved to New Jersey, she went through puberty and got her period. And again, corpses certainly do not menstruate. Moreover, she had to respond to commands and showed variability in her heart rate when her mother would speak to her. And this drew a lot of attention from neurologists who were interested. And she actually underwent an MRI scan uh, nine and a half months later. And it showed that her brain was largely preserved. Her brain stem, which controls breathing, was was very much destroyed, but the upper parts of her brain were intact. And so she's an important case because unquestionably, Jahai McMath fulfilled the American Academy of Neurology guidelines for determining brain death. But two neurologists later that 
uh, following year testified that she was not brain dead, but in a minimally conscious state. So the guidelines are not sufficient for declaring someone to be irreversibly dead. And in fact, the new American Academy of Neurology Brain Death Guidelines just released a few weeks ago on October 11th of 2023. Under those guidelines, Jahai McMath would also have been incorrectly diagnosed as being brain dead. All right. So some people might be asking, wait a minute, you know, let's talk about quality of life. But quality of life is not the same as being alive or dead. And we could have a whole discussion on human beings deciding the quality of life as if they're God and they determine what quality is. But none of this would really be an issue if there wasn't money to be made in what you call the transplantation train. Explain that. So the transplant industry does drive this. And for monetary reasons, certainly uh, it's a $48 billion industry. Also, there are just people who are, are true believers that, that they are out there, you know, doing good by finding organs to help other people. Again, it's, it's not wrong to want to help other people, but not at the cost of killing someone to do it. And so brain dead people are not biologically dead. They do not meet uh, the criteria that for traditionally for thousands of years, people have of faith have accepted as far as wanting to know that the spirit has departed before declaring death. And so these people are actually being killed by the removal of their organs, which is a serious concern, you know, because this has been going on now for, you know, 50, 60 years. And as people learn about this, there's a lot of, of remorse. Uh, people's consciences have been violated because they were basically lied to about this diagnosis of brain death. There's a lot of spiritual heal- healing that needs to be done as the truth comes out about this diagnosis. It seems to me that your worldview, your understanding of the way things are, which is really what a worldview is, if you deny that the image of God is in man, and as was the case for centuries at least, but maybe thousands of years, the idea would be, if you were looking at things from a biblical point of view, that God determines when life begins and God determines when life ends. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't work or innovate in order to help people get over things that are able to be attained or or they're able to be cured. We would call that thinking God's thoughts after him and as people advance in knowledge to be able to help people. Now, oftentimes people will cite the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, but I like to remind people Hippocrates is not God and we have the law of God that helps us determine what's right and wrong. And thou shalt not murder is among those things that God says. So even though a lot of people bolt at the idea that what goes on with certain kinds of transplants, as I mentioned, where the person has to be alive, they're really just looking at people as a bunch of clump of cells. And as long as the assessment is, well, this person isn't going to have a meaningful life, he or she is a vegetable, a term I absolutely hate that the worldview doesn't look at people as living souls. So talk a little bit about the mindset of those who want to dismiss the idea that this integration of the soul with the body, with the mind, with all the organs is something not to be considered. Well, I'll give you another another actual case. Um, Dr. Alan Schumann uh, is a retired neurologist. He worked at UCLA Medical Center. He had a, a two-year-old child, a two-year-old boy, and that boy had suffered uh, brain injury. And that boy fulfilled the criteria for brain death. So this was presented to the, the boy's parents, and he was uh, it, a request was made that that little two-year-old should become an organ donor. Um, but for their own personal reasons, the parents said, no, we're, we're not interested in donating our son's organs. We would just like to have the ventilator withdrawn and allow him to die with in, in our arms, basically, in, in a dignified way. So their, their wishes were followed. The de- ventilator was discontinued, but the little boy started to breathe. 
Now, this shocked and horrified not only the family, but the doctors and the nurses and everyone involved, because here's a little kiddo that was, you just told the parents, he's dead. We'd like to harvest his organs. And when you take him off the ventilator, he breathes, obviously showing he is not dead, brain dead, any kind of dead. And if you consider that had the family decided to harvest, you know, give their little boy for organ harvest, he would have met his actual death in a cold operating room under the surgical scalpel, having his heart and lungs removed. A horrifying death, a barbaric death, rather than being able to die in their arms. You know, it's it's a very difficult thing to consider. The problem with our current system is that all the mistakes are covered up. We have a, a survivor's page on our website, respectforhumanlife.com, and we have over a dozen examples of people who were legitimately, according to the neurological criteria of their, their times and of their countries, they were declared brain death. They were all eligible for organ harvesting, but for one reason or another, uh, there were often uh, requests by the family, could we wait a day or two while we assemble family to say goodbye? And then during that time, the people woke up. Some of them have gone on to live normal lives. Uh, Zach Dunlap is a famous case from uh, the USA. The helicopter was just in the process of landing with the transplant team to harvest his organs. The medical staff did not determine that he was not brain dead. It was his cousin. His cousin did not believe Zach was brain dead and scraped the bottom of his foot with a a pocket knife and Zach withdrew his foot. Even then, his nurse said, well, that's just a reflex. You know, that that doesn't count. So his cousin then jammed a fingernail up under Zach's fingernail and Zach kind of not only pulled away, but pretty much took a swing at him, at which point now doctors had to reevaluate this diagnosis of brain death. Zach made a complete recovery and walked out of the hospital on his own power and and was able to get married and and now has a a little girl. You can see his video if you go to our survivors page on our website. The problem is, is that people who are being diagnosed brain dead may even be alert enough and aware enough to hear the diagnosis, which was Zach's case. Zach testified in a video interview later that he heard doctors telling his family that Gosh, your son is brain dead. He's passing away. And he said he was able to hear, but unable to move or respond or sign that he really wasn't brain dead, that he was in there listening. And that is one of the other horrifying things to think about. So it's called a donation. And I think people think highly of their intent. When I no longer need them or they're no longer functioning, I'll give them away. Nobody is compensated for their organs. The family is not compensated for the organs of loved ones who have their organs taken out. So do you think the term donation hides the fact that there is a bottom line financial interest? Because a lot of these donations, you know, there's a transplant acquisition team, and then you go to the hospitals and their surgery with no promise that it's going to work. And it's not like people get a refund or, or they have to give back the money after they do it. It's more like, well, see, we tried and it it just didn't work in this case. So do you think the language has been changed to sanitize it and make it look noble? Yes, I think even worse than that, uh, I think it's indoctrination and propaganda. Uh, I have a quote that I, I show to doctors when I'm speaking. It's a, a quote from uh, Dr. David Rodriguez Arias, who's a moral philosopher in bioethics. He says that policymaking becomes indoctrination whenever public opinions and preferences are intentionally manipulated in ways that destroy or prevent citizens' independent judgment and rational deliberation. He goes on to say, the history of death determination in the context of organ donation can be described as an indoctrinating attempt to settle a moral controversy. So it has been purposely sanitized. The the happy pictures that you see at the Department of Motor Vehicles don't tell you that when you are a registered organ donor, you have set a process into play that cannot be stopped. Your your family cannot object and say, no, wait, wait, wait. We don't want his tissues or organs 
harvested. Signing that card means they will be harvested, even though your heart may be beating, your uh, you may be warm, you may be healing wounds, you may be just dating a, a baby. There are uh, twelve states that will stop a pregnant woman from having her intensive care withdrawn so that she can deliver that baby. But other states allow that to be that plug to be pulled. Now, interesting, I was thinking about the pregnant situation, and it's really impossible since the time of Louis Pasteur, we've always said there is no such thing as spontaneous generation. Life does not come from non-life. And so I think the, the case of, of the pregnant woman who has been declared brain dead, being able to give birth to a living child, it has to prove to us that this person is certainly not dead because life does not come from non-life. A baby cannot come from a dead woman. You also cited in your book, and and not that a lot of this information wasn't horrifying, as I was telling you before we started recording, that I couldn't read your book straight through. I had to take a chapter, put it down, because it was truly upsetting. But there was a case where you talked about, and I think this is widespread, where insurance will not cover if you say, no, we don't want to donate the organs, we want treatment to continue to happen. So. People say, okay, it's on your dime. You've got to find the money for this. But if you agree to organ donation, then insurance will cover it. Explain that to my listeners. Yeah, that's correct. That was brought out uh, in the case of Aiden Hallou. Uh, Aiden Hallou uh, was a young uh, University of Nevada, Reno student who had abdominal pain and in 2015 went in and, and was given uh, an exploratory surgery of her abdomen to see why her abdominal pain was so bad. And after the surgery, she just never woke up. Apparently, she had had some low blood pressure and some complications, and uh, doctors went on to declare her to be brain dead. But her father disputed the diagnosis because, again, this is his little girl. He he sees her warm. He he says that the doctors are telling me she's dead, yet they're treating her with antibiotics and giving her a blood transfusions. How can how can she be dead? And so he took the case all the way to the Nevada Supreme Court. The Nevada Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, ruled that the criteria doctors had used, the American Academy of Neurology guideline for brain death, did not meet the letter of the law under the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which is the law in some form in in just about every state. So what happened then with, with Aiden Hallou, because of this controversy in Nevada, the Nevada legislature uh, in 2017 changed the Nevada law so that now in Nevada, so I'm telling you, be, be careful if you're a citizen of Nevada or driving through Nevada, the Nevada law now says that you must be declared dead according to the American Academy of Neurology guideline or any successor organization to the American Academy of Neurology guidelines. So in perpetuity, the people who live in Nevada or drive through Nevada, if you end up in a hospital there, must be declared dead according to that standard, which does not meet the Uniform Determination of Death Act for most of the country. In most of the country, the the law states that you have to have an irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. Whereas the new AAN guidelines will allow people to be declared dead who still have partial brain function, who might have electrical activity on their EEG, who might have a neurosecretory function from the hypothalamus, a part of the brain. So Nevada is is a, a sort of an outlier right now in the United States as far as brain death laws. But in terms of insurance now saying, oh, we're yeah. going to conform to that, um, it's almost, well, it is coercive because then family has to think the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and the hospital might say, we will no longer treat because you don't have insurance. That's correct. And that was brought out in the Aiden Halu case. The Nevada legislature went on to say, if you decide to 
be an organ donor. And yes, of course, care will continue and uh, insurance will continue to cover the cost of care. And that has been a problem. There are a, a couple of foundations who, who do try to help families who want to dispute a brain death diagnosis. Uh, one of them is uh, the Life Guardian Foundation uh, run by Dr. Paul Byrne, who has been contesting uh, the brain death idea since the late 1970s. And uh, the other one is the Healthcare Advocacy and Leadership Organization, or HALO, H-A-L-O, because there's so many HALOs on the internet, you need to Google them under HALO Voice, V-O-I-C-E. Uh, they will provide help for people who are looking for ways to uh, continue to provide care for people. They've even, uh, I know Dr. Byrne has helped bring people who wanted to continue care to Guatemala to con- you know, continue to get care for their loved one in an ICU somewhere. Uh, DeHai McMath, again, was moved to New Jersey, where where their care was able to be continued. But it is coercive uh, that if you become an organ donor, things are paid for, care continues until those organs are harvested. And if you don't want to be an organ donor, you have no no one to turn to oftentimes. Okay. A couple of definitions that I think would be useful. What's the difference between being disabled or severely injured and being dead from your point of view? Well, disabled means you're still alive, right? So this, this has been a, a, a recent controversy as well. Uh, the Uniform Law Commission was petitioned recently by the American Academy of Neurology uh, to change our brain death laws uh, to become a little bit more lax, to to allow them to be based on uh, just a lack of a few functions, not all functions. And and the people who really were militant against this were a lot of the disability communities and, and disability advocacy groups, telling people that they are somehow dead based on a lack of function is is a very concerning thing for people who lack certain abilities. Dead again a in death, a line has been crossed. No mortal can return from the dead without divine intervention. Uh, disabled means that you're sick or injured, but we can certainly help you. And, and it's been doctor's role throughout the millennia to provide care. You know, I don't know why on earth doctors are so excited to declare people dead. I mean, doctors, we're, we're we went to medical school to be in the business of, of life, to be in the business of health and healing and helping, not to be, you know, declaring people dead so that you can dissect them on the operating room table, frankly. Right. Okay. The difference between a respirator and a ventilator. Okay. Now, a ventilator is the correct term. So a ventilator is a machine that basically just puffs oxygenated air into a person. A ventilator has historically been incorrectly called a respirator. Respiration to a scientist, to a medical person in in the strict technical sense, respiration is bringing oxygen into the tissues of or the organs of the entire body and removing carbon dioxide and waste from the tissues of the entire body. So a ventilator puffs in air, but it does not perform the biochemical changes of taking in oxygen or removing carbon dioxide. It just puffs. And so a ventilator does not produce life. Uh, It just support someone who can't breathe for themselves. Okay. Do people ever die when they're on a ventilator? Yes, you can certainly die when you're on a ventilator. And that's a a common uh, misperception people have. I've had people ask me that about a pacemaker too. Can I die while I have a pacemaker? Again, our our life and death are characterized by the removal of the God-given spirit, at which time all of our systems stop working together in that beautiful harmony that we see during life. So I ask doctors about this sometimes. I I talked to some medical students at Texas A&M University last month, and I said, now think about it. If you took your gross anatomy cadaver and hooked it up to a ventilator, would it look alive? And they, you know, it's nonsense. Of course, it causes people to laugh. Naturally not. And so just being on a ventilator, a machine cannot 
produce life in a something that is non living. Right. Okay. Another thing I'd like you to address. When people have a child, one of the things the child is given is a, 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 a test to see what's working and then they're given a score and they say, okay, this baby is healthy to this degree or another. In a similar way, the way oftentimes brain death is declared is by a test being given to critically ill, unconscious people and making an assessment based on the test. So these assessments are giving a gradation of life or health or whatever. Explain the apnea test and why you say nobody should agree to an apnea test. So as part of the American Academy of Neurology Brain Death Guidelines, including the new one just released a few weeks ago, uh, an apnea test uh, pretty much must be performed. There are a few times when an apnea test cannot be performed and they give you some workarounds. But in general, it is a test that is a, a big part of a brain death examination. The problem with an apnea test is that the patient is removed from the ventilator for up to 10 minutes and observed for breathing. Now, if you think about it, if you have a brain injury, it means that your brain is already on the edge of being able to sustain itself with with probably some diminished circulation already. Now take the person off of the ventilator. This is absolutely the worst thing you can do for someone with a brain injury. As levels of carbon dioxide build up in the blood, it actually causes more intracranial pressure, which decreases the blood flow to the brain even more. There have been cases where someone was not declared brain dead after the first apnea test, but keep doing apnea tests. And after the second or the third, you can make them fulfill the criteria for brain dead. The test does absolutely nothing for the patient, him or herself. It only benefits uh, other people who might possibly want that person's organs or that person's ICU bed. Uh, I liken it uh, to a saying, what if you had someone who was having a heart attack and their heart is in imminent danger. Would you make that person run on a treadmill? Of course not. The apnea test is like taking someone with a brain injury and making them run on a treadmill. Uh, Despite the fact that the apnea test can cause more brain damage, and it's an unethical test because it does nothing for the patient, the new guidelines, despite the fact that the apnea test can cause more brain injury, The new guidelines state that clinicians do not have to obtain informed consent before doing it. This is something that the Uniform Law Commission recently declined to adopt when it tabled the revised Uniform Determination of Death Act this past September. Uh, The fact that you don't even need to get consent to do a test that harms the patient is tremendously, tremendously problematic. Okay, so... We've just gone through lies and deceptions with regards to the seriousness of this COVID-19 virus. We've also heard that vaccinations, which it's questionable whether you can actually call this a vaccination, but we'll call it a vaccination for this discussion, are beneficial. And if you have it, not only will you be healthier, you will not infect others. And so If you know where to look, you can see data is not supporting those um, assertions, yet mainstream um, media and a lot of other institutions are fostering this lie, okay? So we have a situation where people are trusting doctors less and less in the medical profession. And I've heard criticism, especially after the first podcast that you and I did last year, is like, I hate what you're doing because you're making it so people will not trust their doctors, as if trusting your doctor was the highest good. Talk a little bit about this. Well, the doctors say they said he's dead. I mean, who were we? We didn't go to medical school. When when I watch debates on this between doctors or between medical ethicists, the interesting thing to me when I watch is that people who propound that brain death is a good diagnosis and a good thing. They don't have any tests. They don't have 
any studies. They don't have any data. What they have is arguments from authority or arguments from the majority, both of which are logical fallacies unless they're backed up by the truth. So when I talked to the Texas A&M medical students, they said, gosh, Dr. Klesse, you make a good point, but what are we supposed to do when we're, we're being trained and, and the people in authority over us are, are telling us these people are brain dead? And what I told them is when, when you question authority or, or when you want to challenge this, I find that there's a, a real power in just asking questions. I said, why don't you ask the doctor? Now, you've said this man is brain dead. Is he biologically dead? How can he be biologically dead if he has a beating heart? And so often, doctors, I have to say, if you think back to the kid in your class who was going to be a doctor, he was a very good student. He knew how to answer the test questions correctly, and he learned how to please the teacher, I'm afraid to say, but it's quite true. So a lot of doctors learn the brain death guidelines, and we we know how to fill in the right answers on the test, and they've really not thought about it a lot. So there is a power in asking questions to get people to stop and think and question. And in fact, I find the younger generation is much, much better at questioning authority than my generation ever was. So I have great hope, as I was talking to those medical students, that they'll be able to ask questions. And the other thing that medical students asked me, they said, gee, you know, Dr. Klesig, isn't this going to make people mad? And I said to her, said to her I said, you know, I find that when I talk to people, sometimes they do get mad. But usually the people that get mad, it's because I've touched something deep inside of them that has made them think. It's made them react because I've shaken a belief. I've shaken a worldview. And they might get mad at you. But they're going to think about it later. And that's what's going to cause change in the long term. So I I would not be afraid to ask questions. I would not be afraid even if someone gets mad at you. Because it means that that person is now thinking more deeply about the topic. And as you and I have talked before we started this, the message of Scripture will make you mad. You are a sinner in need of God's grace. And there's nothing you can do to purchase it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. And... For a lot of people, myself included, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that I'm totally depraved. Thank you. Um, give me some credit, but the Bible doesn't give us credit. And the questioning of authority, especially in medicine, I mean, you can look back on a lot of practices that are no longer done because it was determined they weren't based on science. They were based on emotion or convenience. And so I I think these medical students will need to go a step further and to identify their understanding of life, where it comes from, who gives life, who can take life according to scripture. And the only way that the education process will change, if these people, maybe they don't get to become doctors, maybe they flunk out, but they've started a process to return to justice and righteousness, because this whole issue is one of justice, don't you think? Absolutely. I think this is, this is a civil rights injustice of the greatest magnitude that we're taking these vulnerable people with a brain injury and we're consigning them to organ harvest. When think of all the good we could do if we would just take the time to work with more of these patients and find new developments. I mean, people are, the advances in medical science for brain injury could be a lot further along than they are right now. We've learned so much. I mean, a man named Terry Wallace awoke from what was considered to be a persistent vegetative state after 13 years. It shows that the adult brain can heal to that great extent. People are recognizing a phenomenon that is called global ischemic penumbra, that is the perfect mimicker of brain death. And what it is, is that the brain blood flow has dropped so that the electrical activity in the brain stops and your neurologic exam doesn't respond, but there still is enough blood flow that the brain tissue is still viable. With care, it could improve. I, I tell people it's sort of like what happens in your home during a power outage. You know, the electrical goes off and the lights turn off, but the wiring isn't destroyed. I mean, 
increase that power again and the lights will come back on. And that's why I think so many people have been able to recover from a brain death diagnosis. They they didn't have enough blood flow to their brain to have function, but the wiring wasn't destroyed. And all that needed to be done was to improve the, the blood flow to the brain and they were able to heal. The other thing people are finding, they're using a technique called a functional MRI, which has now been able to find consciousness in people who were previously thought to be unconscious. And the other thing they're finding out is that low body temperatures, such as are often used now during resuscitation, they lower your body temperature so that you have a better chance of being resuscitated. Those can sort of turn off your brain for up to a week. And so it might take a whole week after you're rewarmed back to normal temperature before your brain sort of resets the circuits. Sadly, the new brain death guidelines say 24 hours is all they need to wait after rewarming. And, and how many more of these people would wake up if their doctors just gave them a little more time? Dr. Cicero Coimba in uh, Brazil actually reversed a brain death diagnosis in a patient by simply supplementing thyroid hormone in a lady. This lady was diagnosed as being brain dead, but as part of that, she had low thyroid function, and by giving her thyroid hormone, a component of brain swelling called thyroid-induced myxedema was removed, improving blood flow to her brain. She was able to communicate and talk to her parents. She got so much better. So there's a lot to be learned if only we weren't consigning these people all to be organ donors. And I'd go so far as to say, just like legalized abortion solves, that I'll put those in, that word in quote, solves people's problems. Now, I don't have to give up going to university. Now, I don't have to marry this woman and support a child. And so there are a lot of people who might not actually have a problem with someone being killed they are looking at it from the point of view of their own convenience. Well, I can tell you there are a lot of people who are horrified at the prospect of having to take care of a disabled person. And partly because of my experience growing up, my mother suffered a number of strokes and she was pretty much an invalid who couldn't talk, but we knew she was conscious. It was difficult. It it put a strain on our family, but no one ever said, gee, it would be better if she was dead. When she did die, there was a component of relief, but the sadness was there. So I think a lot of people are willing to go along with this current practice because it takes them off the hook. What would we have to do? And since so many people rely on outside care as opposed to the God-given responsibility that the family takes care of its members, that there are a lot of concerns that creep into it so that these diagnoses might be welcome to people. And I, I, from my opinion, they don't realize to the degree at which they're offending God. Well, I, I don't think killing someone is ever the answer, whether it be at the beginning of life with abortion or at the end of life with, with euthanasia. I don't think death is ever the answer. And I, I commend you for, for hanging in there for your mom. I mean, the, the, the good that you did for, for your mom, you can never calculate. It's, it's a wonderful, a wonderful thing. And it does seem hard. You know, I've cared for my elderly mother with dementia in our home for 10 years now. And it's not always easy, but you know, it's, it's something that honors the image of God. And therefore honors God. When we care for God's people, we are, we are upholding his righteous law. And so it's a, it's a good work that we do, even when it's hard. And just to clarify, it was my father's decision because I was in grammar school at the time. And there were times I resented it. You know, our living room was turned into a hospital room with a hospital bed. And uh, on my less good days, I was complaining that I didn't have a normal childhood. But you know, as I grew older, and I saw the dedication and love of my father that never diminished towards my mother, it gave me a real picture of what till death do us part, not until somebody says you're dead, and now I'm off the hook. So this has a lot to do with the biblical world and life view. And I think of all people, Christians should really consider this and not just be governed by the emotional tug of, well, he's not going to need them. We might as well do some good for other people. 
Yeah, and your dad was a doctor too, wasn't he? He knew what yes, he, he was, was getting into. Mm-hmm. Yep, he um he worked during the day, and then he spent the whole evening by her bed, sitting up in a chair. I don't know how he did it, but like I said, it was a really good lesson for me and what it means to be a spouse who honors the vows before God. And, you know, at the time as a kid, I didn't appreciate it, but I think it's shaped my life a lot. And then as a a young girl, I had to care for someone like this and she still was my mom, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and Mm -hmm. you probably know this, um, and you can give a medical reason for it, but my mom was very frustrated in her inability. And sometimes she'd get mad and slap you right in the face. And it was a frustration and I get it. Yeah. Poor thing. One last thing before we go. So it seems that the medical industry has got onto the fact that of what you call the brain death fallacy. And so they engineered or came up with a new way to harvest people's organs. And it's under the banner of donation after cardiac death. You've been saying the heart is still beating. And so it's not dead when they're brain dead. So now they have this new protocol that seems to you know, stick the camel's nose under the tent and make it acceptable. Please explain this because I think there are things that people need to understand about it. Before the idea of brain death, all attempts at transplant were pretty much taken from from cadaver organs. And the results were were really dismal. The the organs, as soon as that circulation stops, they very quickly uh, become unsuitable for transplant. So The idea was revisited in the 1990s in the constant search for for more uh, harvestable organs. Could people who had signed a do not resuscitate order, uh, meaning that they believed that either they were near the end of life or their life wasn't worth living, uh, if these people voluntarily said, I don't want to be resuscitated, could you find a way to harvest organs from those people? So in those people, they've come up with what's uh, variously called donation after cardiac or donation after circulatory death. So these are people who die in a in sort of a planned way. The, they've said, I don't want to be resuscitated. So the person is taken to the operating room oftentimes and their ventilator and any drips or medications are stopped. And the person is then observed often right on the operating room table until their heart stops beating. And then doctors have a, a time where they, they just sort of wait to be sure the heart won't spontaneously resume beating. And, and there's no specified time for this. In uh, in my home state, it's two minutes. In, in Canada, it's five minutes. It, it's sort of variable depending on the center. And then if the heart doesn't spontaneously start beating again, the doctors begin to perform an organ harvest. Uh, the, the problem with this is that doctors and nurses know that people are routinely able to be resuscitated after just two minutes of heart stoppage. In fact, there have been cases where people whose hearts had stopped up to 10 minutes had spontaneous return of their own heartbeat, even without doctors and nurses resuscitating them. So there's a difference between resuscitation, as we mentioned earlier, and resurrection. Again, if you are dead Only by a divine act of God can you be resurrected. However, if your heart has stopped, you, for a matter of of minutes at least, if not up to 10 or 15 minutes, are capable of being resuscitated. And I would uh, say that if you are able to be resuscitated, you are never, never dead. So these people who have been observed for two minutes for their heart not to spontaneously restart, they are, they are still within the window where they could be resuscitated and therefore they are not dead. And that's something even transplant proponents admit to. Dr. Robert Trug is a, a transplant proponent, and he's he has written in medical journals that these people, after two to five minutes of heart stoppage, are not known to be dead. It's something people, that, if they're honest, will admit. And in fact, there was a case in our neighboring state of Illinois where a, a young woman underwent such a procedure and they waited two minutes and her heart didn't start up again. And then they started harvesting their her kidneys. And during that harvest surgery, they noticed that she started to gasp for breath and that she had pulses. Her heart had restarted. 
uh, the county coroner later had to determine that she, her ultimate cause of death uh, was homicide. She had been killed by organ harvesting, ultimately. Doctors have even a more gruesome type of harvest that they'll do if they want to harvest uh, more delicate organs like the lungs, the hearts, or the intestine. Uh, what they'll do to these people after that two-minute wave-off period is they'll go in and they'll start by clamping off the circulation to the brain to make these people brain dead on purpose, and then they'll hook them up to a cardiac bypass machine and restart the heart and, and reoxygenate all those organs and perform a full resuscitation on the organs after having made the patient brain dead on purpose. And that's it's it's very macabre and it's 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 something that i think if people had fully informed consent about the about what's going on behind those operating room doors i don't think very many people would knowingly consent to that type of procedure so before we go because i we've covered all the points i wanted to cover if there's more that you wanted to cover feel free to do so but the obvious question is how do we write this very wrong situation where do we go from here? This is a well-established industry. It's a well-established protocol. Uh, doesn't mean it's right, but it's there. What's your okay. suggestion having the benefit of being on the inside, being a medical professional yourself and societally what's happening? What should people do? Well, I like to always finish, you know, when I talk to people with, with giving action points, right? Because we, there are things you can do. And, and one of the very simple things we can do is Refuse to be a registered organ donor would be the first thing. So if you have signed a donor card, you can go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and have that permission removed. The other thing, however, is that the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, when it was revised in 2006, now states that if you don't want to be a donor, you must register a specific refusal. Otherwise, if you come into the hospital incapacitated and, and your family can't be found, even the hospital administrator can donate organs or tissues on your behalf absent a specific refusal. So some people uh, carry a specific refusal card. If you go to our website, respectforhumanlife.com, we have a link to the one from the Halo Voice website, a very nice refusal to donate card. You can tell your doctor to put it in your electronic medical record that you are refusing to be an organ and tissue donor. I think that would probably follow with you uh, better than any wallet card uh, at times. The other thing that you need to know is that unless you live in Nevada, uh, you can still uh, refuse to be declared brain dead, at least uh, according to the law in your state. The, the American Academy of Neurology Standards do not meet the legal standard for death under the UDDA in most states, and, and you might be able to get an attorney to back you up. I explained to doctors uh, at a medical conference that I uh, spoke at last week, uh, doctors need to refuse. If you are a doctor, you need to refuse to perform an apnea test. It is an unethical test, and it, it does not uh, comply with your oath to care for patients. Uh, certainly, if you are a neurologist, uh, you can cite that someone else has performed an apnea test and say that the brain death guidelines have been fulfilled or not, but you don't have to state that you believe that this actually equals death. And you should talk to your uh, colleagues and your patients if you're a doctor about this. Uh, I recommend that everyone become aware of the controversy surrounding this diagnosis. Our website, respectforhumanlife.com, is a good way, and, and the new book, The Brain Death Fallacy, is available through our website or through Amazon. I think that we also need to remember to be compassionate. Uh, people have made decisions about organ donation and harvesting in the past using the best information they had available at the time. And I think we need to give them spiritual care now that they learn the facts of what actually is happening in these procedures. And, and that spiritual care is very important. Right. Um, I've had people criticize me saying, oh, so you're saying my father shouldn't be alive. He received a transplant or you say this or that. I don't, I don't have to say any of that because I believe in a sovereign God who foreordains whatever comes to pass. But that doesn't mean everything that people do is right, even if they were doing it with the best of intentions. And that's why I think it's important for people to understand from a biblical theological point of view that when we allow modern science to make claims that are in contradiction to the scripture, 
we've got to stick with the scripture, even if that will bring mockery or disdain, as the Bible says, let God be true and all men liars. Absolutely right. We're already getting the the disdain from the pro-life end of things at the beginning of life. Why not at the end of life too? Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Klesig. I appreciate you joining me again. What's next on the horizon for you? Are you going to dig deeper into this? Is there another book in the future? Well, there's there's some calls out now um, saying that we should abandon the dead donor rule altogether. The dead donor rule says that you know someone cannot be killed by organ harvesting, and it's an ethical stance. But now people are coming out and saying, you know, maybe if we just got people to say, I consent to be killed by organ harvesting, everything's okay. And again, consenting to do an immoral act is is not biblically permissible. So I, I may be looking at that in the future. All right. Well, very good. Listeners, hope we have given you things to think about. If you'd like to comment on this, out of the question podcast at gmail.com is how you do it. And once again, Dr. Klesig, would you give the um, URLs for your website? Sure. Our rev- website is respectforhumanlife.com. The new book is The Brain Death Fallacy, and it's available on Amazon. All right. Thanks for joining us. We will talk with you next time. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.